Good evening. Calling to order the Monday, September 21st meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, recorded by ACMI. First on our agenda this evening is an environmental design review special permit relating to 19 Massachusetts Avenue uh, with a request to amend special permit number 3035. So if the applicant and its representatives could come forward and introduce themselves, please. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, my name is Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor, and I represent Claremont Corporation. With me is Ned Carney from Claremont Corporation. Um, and I can introduce, if you want, the team that's here tonight. Uh, Elias Petuchas is the president of Claremont. He's here as well. Uh, we have Fred Keylor, who's the site civil uh, engineer. He is from H.W. Moore and Associates. And uh, Michael Murphy, who's the architect, who's from Procon Architectural. So, uh, oh, Matt. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Matt Murphy. Sorry. Matt about that. Oh, wait a minute. Who's Michael? He's, he's my. Oh, your assistant. Man. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> All right. Um, so you have uh, what was submitted. I want to first say that. There was a little confusion about the number of parking spaces. I worked off of the special permit that was granted by this board um, in 19, I think it was 1998, which had 73 outside spaces and 11, uh, 73 garage spaces and 11 outside spaces. There are actually 74 spaces in the garage and 14 outside spaces, um, so for a total of 88. Um, if I may give you just a brief um, recitation about uh, the project and our position, and then I'll turn it over if you want, or whatever way you want to uh, organize this. This um, hotel was built uh, after this board granted uh, environmental design review and a special permit uh, in 1998 to the Burkhardt Corporation. In January 2012, Burkhardt sold the hotel to the Claremont Corporation uh, they, are, um, they operated as a Homewood Suites under the Hilton brand. Now, um, I don't know how many of you saw the original hotel or have been in the present hotel, but I, I've um, been there, and it's a tremendous improvement over what was originally built, far more amenities and a much uh, nicer interior. Presently, there are 100 uh, hotel rooms. Uh, they're looking to add a three-story addition to add 21 rooms. And um, they will require some relief with respect to parking. Now, I want to first talk about the public parking spaces because our uh, bylaw talks about having so many uh, spaces for public area. Uh, there was a boardroom which was approved in the original plan. And there was a uh, restaurant type area as well. Several years ago, um, after speaking with Ms. Kowalski and uh, Mr. Byrne, uh, Claremont decided that their uh, their guests did not need meeting space. They needed a fitness center. So that boardroom was con uh, converted to a fitness center, <coughs> exercise room, exclusively for hotel guests. The present restaurant area can only be utilized by people who stay in the hotel. So you cannot go in. It's not like if you go to the Burlington Marriott and have dinner there. You cannot enter the, the restaurant area unless you are a guest staying there. You get the free breakfast, and I think at, in the afternoon there's some... Yeah, it just does an appetizer, hot food type thing for guests. So I would suggest to you that the, the concept of there being needing to be extra parking spaces for public area is not uh, required here because there is no public space. Um, you also have, we provided to you, uh, the hotel kept account with respect to how many people uh, brought a vehicle to the site. Uh, generally speaking, even when the hotel was at nearly f uh, full capacity or was at 100 rooms, generally there were only 60 or 70 parking spaces that were being utilized. That primarily, um, the hotel believes, is a direct result of the fact that this is a hotel where uh, there's a lot of business people that come in to the hotel and then come in by taxi or come in by livery service or come in by public transportation and then uh, take those types of services to whatever meetings they're going going to. Um, there is some, uh, there has never been an excess, so out of the 100 rooms, the, the 88 parking spaces have never been utilized. I went through the 357 nights um, that were there and they've never been utilized. Uh, 
what we would suggest that is that the board has the ability to reduce the required spaces to 80% of those required under the off-street parking table. That you have the ability to grant some smaller size spaces for compact cars. And then, um, as I set out in my letter, under 812C, you can modify the parking lot, or I would suggest here the garage, to provide for stacked parking. And that section of the bylaw specifically refers to that. Uh, and I looked in our bylaw to see if there was a definition of stacked parking, and as you know, there isn't. So then you next go to the building code to see if they have a definition of stacked parking, and there is not. But I went to Wellesley's, I found a definition in the Wellesley bylaw, and stacked parking talks about the parking of cars, one in back of another, such that one or more vehicles may have to be moved by an attendant. I also found um, an opinion written by Ms. Kowalski when she was the planning director in Reading for the Goddard School that talked about stack parking. And um, uh, my, there's a case, I, Bruce, you may be familiar with it, Brida versus, I think, Town of Holliston, where uh, the zoning board, or the planning board in that uh, case, allowed a special permit and allowed the use of stack parking to get to the total parking uh, requirement. And the, the land court said, no, because your bylaw doesn't give you that ability, doesn't talk about stacked parking. So I would suggest to you that you have that ability under 812C if, um, to modify the capacity for this under, uh, count, underground garage. And I would suggest to you that the hotel is totally prepared uh, to use a valet service um, to facilitate that. Now, um, you have in your hands out, you have the renderings, um, you also have the uh, parking counts, uh, you also have the Arlington Conservation Commission. We spent a considerable amount of time at the Arlington Conservation Commission, uh, and they looked at various parameters for this building. Um, and they actually wanted to, to us to take the outside parking um, and do a zip car type thing, but the bylaw doesn't provide that uh, to make up parking spaces. But we, the Claremont has agreed uh, to compensatory flood storage of two to one ratio and improvements to the riverfront area and buffer zone. So there's going to be um, a little over 5,300 square feet of new plantings in that area. And also there's going to be an additional 2,600 square feet of plantings on the hotel site. There, um, in cons consultation with the town engineer who reviewed all of the plans, uh, Claremont uh, has been requested to install two leaching catch basins at Henderson and Solomon Street at that intersection, and a new flood vault in the northeast corner of the garage. Now, um, we had two meetings with the neighbors. Um, they were very receptive. Um, there was no negative comments about this. They had some concerns, um, and I will tell you, one of them is they'd like the hotel to refurbish the underground parking garage, to paint it, put more lighting. One of the um, neighbors said that she thought that some of the, the hotel guests were parking on the Marley property because if you go there, you can see it's hard to differentiate. Um, so what uh, Claremont Mary, did... what's the Marley property? Oh, I'm this, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. it's the C Grove. with the CVS Monotony Group oh. where the two of them yeah. come together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what Claremont had been doing since that meeting is specifically saying to guests as they check in, where have you parked? And if they parked on that site, they asked them to move. Um, another thing is, uh, actually, it was um, Alan Tosti who said he was in favor of this project, who asked that the, the hotel uh, be willing to maintain the town, for lack of a better word, parks that are out in front and have maintenance clean it on a regular basis because apparently there's a lot of trash and things that catch in there. My client's prepared to do that. Where are these parks? Um, they're right out front. Oh, I mean, okay. Sort of they're not the really yard. parks, but, you know. That's the front yard of the, of the hotel. Just so um, I can it's actually along. the public. Um, it, he's talking about the public space. Oh, talking about median strip? You're talking about along the yard? Along the parkway? No, he's talking or? about here, isn't he? Yeah, I believe there's some sort of little park here. Oh, here it is. Um, if you're looking at the street from the hotel to the left, which means 16 in the hotel, that's just overgrown and more of a landscape, a maintenance. Okay. That's what the neighbors expressed interest in. Where is it? Um, right here. I believe there's some kind of bench seating or 
uh, park set up right around here. And then it's not that big. It's no, not you're big. Not, you're in the water there, I think. There's no, no, you, yeah, you so it's right in here, and then there's the bridge, too, with the culvert so that comes underneath is, the, uh, or a culvert. Is it a landscape right zone along mm -hmm. the back of the curb, back of the sidewalk? I believe it's a public park. Um, just it's like a, a 20 park. by small. We're, we're not How big is it? I want to say like 20 by 40 feet. It's not big at all. There might be a bench for sitting there, and um, it's along the bike path or jogging path that cuts across there. And apparently there's a great deal of litter that um, gets accumulated there. Do you, so do you know if it's town owned or DC owned? The owner, owner would take charge uh, of keeping that I don't clean. Know. Yeah. Uh, not the owner. We we would agree to to yeah. keep it clean on a regular basis. Yeah, you're the owner. He's he, Mr. The West owner of the the hotel. hotel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Right. Good. Sorry. No. No. I thought you meant. You thought it <laughs> no. 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 Now, um, uh, Alan Tosky pointed out that um, the addition would likely, based on what the hotel is running at for occupancy rate, result in about eighty thousand dollars more a year in hotel tax, and then of course the increase in real estate taxes resulting from the increase in value. Um, so that that would be my you know presentation. If we'll do it in whatever order you want to do the presentation and the site civil, the architectural, just let me know. Or questions. I think I'll open up to the public first. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Yeah, I live at um, Twenty One Cottage Ave. Name as well. Oh, Russell Bartash. I live at Twenty One Cottage Ave, which is directly behind the hotel. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the two community meetings. I, you know, my business takes me out nights quite a bit. But a couple of things I was concerned about is the two dumpsters directly behind the hotel, which are not owned by, uh, by the hotel operators. There's a lot of activity there that um, shouldn't be happening. The fence, which I, I, these people have been very responsive. They're already um, contacted, the, contacted the owner, and he's going to agree to repair it. But there could be some mitigation with um, some trees. They planted some pine trees in front of the fence. They really not maintain that well. They don't really block the um, vision of the parking lot, which is what they were intended to do. And maybe some arborvitaes or something like that planted along that side, I, I think would go a long way in, in blocking a lot of the, the, the activity in the parking lot. So that's that's all I really had. So that, just <clears throat> clarification. Uh, sure. So, Sir, are you talking about the dumpsters that are on the hotel's lot or on the Marley they're, they're lot? In the parking lot. In the parking lot. Who but owns them? I think um, the property owner with CVS and doctor's offices. Um, yeah. I okay. He owns them. I know back I was involved when they originally um, had this hotel come to town, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of concerns about it, um, a lot of things. I believe he was supposed to maintain um, a lot of those. Yeah. I think that if I, my understanding, and uh, Carol, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is this is one special permit that covers all those properties, but the hotel is in separate ownership than the lot that the CVS and uh, the restaurant and, and the, the gym is on. Is that, is that That's correct? correct? Okay. And I think Mr. Bartesh understands that, but. I do, but also yeah. when, you, when you're adding space and, and people, I have seen people park there and go to the hotel and they say, I'm, like I said, my vision is so directly behind. Mm -hmm. And it, just if there's some mitigation with some landscaping, it would cure a lot of the issues. It, it's real simple fix. <clears throat> okay, thank you. The only other thing I would add is that with respect to the public space, uh, my client would of course agree to a deed restriction that um, the space in the hotel could not be, in a sense, a restaurant. Um, it could only be in the use it's used right now to alleviate that. And then I would only add that, you know, reviewing the master plan that was recently done, I think that this addition fits in with the master plan. Any other other comments? Seeing none. Bruce? Uh, are the, the other gentlemen who are here are also making presentations? Yes. Um, Fred? Sure. I, I don't mean to disrupt your no. flow, but I just didn't know. <laughs> no. So, please. Sure. But, uh, for the record, Fred Keeler from H.W. Moore Associates, where he is project civil engineers. Uh, the board here is the things that we prepared on, uh, on boards over here to our uh, my left. Uh, the proposed addition is uh, sort of, uh, colored in orange, if you will. 
The existing hotel, Massachusetts Avenue, is over here as we're looking at it. This is the driveway comes down, the hotel. The red outline is the uh, end of the existing building, so the addition comes off the back. Presently, there's a tennis court here, uh, play area in that location, in the sidewalk that leads to it. Uh, there's extensive plantings uh, you'll see on the uh, drawing that's flat on the table uh, in front of Ned. Uh, plantings around what we've highlighted in green on this plan. Uh, it's much prettier on that plan, but uh, the green spaces uh, will be planted with trees and shrubs and so forforth. And there are also extensive plantings on the Yale Life Brook side of the, uh, the, the public path. That are done by you or by somebody else? The plantings on the other side of the brook path. So there's proposed plantings that were done by the landscape architect uh, Nelson uh, Hammer. Or something in connection with the Conservation Commission decision. Sorry? The Conservation Commission decision requires that we do substantial plantings. Where are they? They're shown better on this They're plan. Oh, gotcha. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry this is two scoops of vanilla around the board. That's a, that's a much better plan. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Okay. <laughs> so this is. Is your? that the DCR land? Mm -hmm. This yep. is your planting? Yes. What we have to do to comply with the uh, CONCON. It was mitigation for yeah. the, uh, as part of the conservation approval process? Because that's the riverfront area. Or it's either riverfront or buffer. It's, uh, it's within the 200 foot riverfront area. Yeah. And so the new footprint hardscape here, Andy, is bigger than what was occupied by the basketball court before. Right. And plus, Conservation Commission required moving the building as far away from the Elwife Brook as possible, so that meant that you're taking out six trees. So, compensate CONCOM required more planting in the area closer to Elwife Brook. The, the, the removal of the six trees was the, the, on the other side, it was over here. I think so. Yes, yeah. the yeah. removal of the six yeah. trees is on the property right along here, along the nose in for the existing parking stalls, if you will. And the property goes right up to that. Edge? Who, who's, who owns that? That's DCR. DCR. Okay. Property line is, is right, is a couple okay, feet yeah, off yeah, the of back course, of the building. Of course, yeah. Okay. And then the rest is DCR. Uh, probably goes to the other side of the brook as well, but uh, at least between us and the brook, it's DCR. Got it. Sorry about that. Keep going. For sure. No, no issue. Um, so, as, as Mary mentioned, we went through an extensive uh, permitting process with conservation. They looked at all aspects of the project drainage and the compensatory flood storage, which uh, Mary mentioned we're providing, uh, we're compensating at two to one ratio. We had uh, meetings with the town engineer regarding drainage. Uh, he reviewed our proposed drainage. We've got two uh, subsurface infiltration systems below the building uh, that'll handle our runoff, our increasing runoff from the roof. Uh, we have slightly less pavement, which is a good thing in terms of uh, runoff. We do have impervious surface area associated with the building. These are designed to handle the two 10 and 100 year storm events. Uh, we did, uh, uh, Mr. Chenard did review this and he did uh, agree that uh, we would comply with your stormwater mitigation uh, bylaw. Uh, in terms of uh, parking, we're just uh, the dumpster is, is located here, it's just going to be nudged out a little bit, we're restriping the parking spaces along that edge. We are uh, replacing, there's a catch basin here, part of the uh, drainage mitigation was to remove that existing grade and replace it with a high capacity inlet grade, get the water into the structure, into the drainage system quicker, it'll just help pick up some of the water coming down the driveway and get it into the uh, storm drain system before it, uh, it passes by. There's about uh, 2,600 roughly, uh, 2,600 square feet of additional impervious service area, primarily associated with the building. And as I just mentioned, that is mitigated by the, the uh, proposed stormwater management system. Is the, can I ask a question? Since it, is it raised up or something? Can you get? Under? Yes, the building is elevated on, on columns. I liken it to a, 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 a pier uh, or a boardwalk. So the, the, uh, yes. And what, why is it? That's so the uh, flood waters can flow underneath it as uh, they do today. So it fills in and then it does. What does the water do there? The water, if in a 100 year flood event, would, would back up and go underneath the building. Yep. Right now it would cover yeah, the yeah. tennis courts and the grass. So that allows the water to do what it does today. And then when the flood recedes, it goes. It recedes and does it down. go into those basins? 
Uh, it's not intended to. It's, uh, what, are the, what are those things again? Infiltration. Yeah, those are, let me, if I can turn the page here. Uh, it's 12 inch perforated pipe. Surrounded storm? by fresh stone. It's for uh, the roof drainage from the building oh, to come down. Right. Okay, so it's a roof storm drainage. Roof storm drainage. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to check. Sure. So that's uh, that's designed to take all the roof water. And, and on the other side, on the other plan, yep. is the parking that you removed? It doesn't. Where's the parking you removed? I don't see where you removed any of the 14. We didn't. We're not removing any of the existing curb line. Is so you sort of want to take those away? That edge. Oh, okay. Well, you're so not gaining any either. There's we're not gaining any. We're just restriping them and okay. pushing them out. Got it. But so there's nothing we're underneath the building that's all for flood. No, uh, no. And there never was. It, it was all with the tennis court and a tennis court and lawn yeah. and, the, and the six trees that we spoke of earlier okay. along that edge. It's not high enough either way. Okay. Right. That uh, sums up the civil. Engineering aspects. I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have. Any. What's under the existing building at the same level? Oh, parking. This parking garage. This whole. Oh, so that would fill. Okay, got it. Got right. It. There's an existing flood so sewer vault here. here. It was built as part of the so original it. building, and we're yeah. adding another small one to, to get us to the two to one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Matt Worth with uh, Procon Incorporated, your, your architects. Uh, so just kind of uh, continuing on with uh, what Fred was talking about here. So this is the end of the existing building. This is that existing flood storage vault that's already there. Um, and so we're building off the end. The, the location of the building was based on where we have circulation from the existing so that we can continue that right through. Um, the, like you were saying, the lower level is all on piers to allow for the flood, flood waters to come in and then work their way back out. Um, you know, it's, set, it's seven rooms per floor times three floors, 21 rooms. And uh, elevationally, you can see this here with the way the existing garage is underneath the, the existing garage level goes down into here that you know our floor, our floor height is like six to seven feet above the existing grade. And, you know, so we're maintaining that so we can keep our floor to floors the same. Uh, it also keeps our roof line the same. And then architecturally, we're trying to keep the same vernacular there, the same material, building material, so it looks like it's a seamless addition on. Um, as it, from the, so the, from the front side, where the, where the public mainly sees this, we've got the brick continuing through. On the back side, on, the, on this side, you can see the, the flood storage. Uh, um, grill work that goes in here, which will have some uh, relief doors in it. Uh, the grill work to keep, you know, some of the uh, life livestock <laughs> <laughs> or wildlife out, uh, so that we don't, you know, collect those. And then along the along the, the uh, actual riverside itself, um, you know, it, it's a it's a fiber cement siding material, and so we're continuing that same look, so that we kind of keep the continuity of it all the way across, with then the uh, flood vault, uh, you know, underneath. So the clearance in the new building is not as tall as it is where the parking is. So you're, right, you're the parking existing parking goes down to about here. Okay. So you know it's, it's a full story down. Yeah. This this is only you know probably four to five feet exposed. Mm -hmm. And the bottom of that is that grade, right? You're not. Are you are you going in? This this is grade. Yeah. This yeah. is the existing okay. grade. We're not we're not uh, really manipulating any of the existing grade. Okay. As we go around, you know, as, as from the, you know, the parking is there, and we're just kind of continuing on as we come out. The existing vault that's in white with the car by the truck. Yes. It's just a raised platform. Yes, it's a raised vault, and there, I, I believe there's some planters on on the edges of it, along the top of it. As it comes, there's there's, there's some plant plantings along the top of it here to kind of screen it as from that from this side, but it's just a concrete top. Right in the room level, so you gotta. The first floor uh, rooms look out right above it, so we try to screen it and dress it up a little bit. They're right at the same level, level aren't they? Yes. Oh, or is it lower? No, it's right at the same level. It's right, the, uh, it's, right there. It's, it's, it's right here. So it's like a terrace almost in front. So you gotta yeah. keep it nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. 
questions. Thank you. Would you like Mr. Kilo to review the parking plan? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, as uh, Mary mentioned before, we're not changing any parking externally other than restriping the ones along the face of the new building. So what the change is, if, if uh, so required, would be within the garage level itself. This is the uh, sort of a composite view of the site plan and the, uh, the overall building and the overall parking garage with the entrance here, which is right there. So we've got room. The idea would be to, to tandem park along this the edge closest to Air White Brook, if you will, allows for better uh, maneuvering at the driveway entrance. So, and these would be uh, parking spaces that uh, attendants would move the cars as they needed to to let people in or out or, or, and so forth. So, uh, we've shown, uh, I believe, uh, 13 tandem stalls uh, that we've striped on this plan. Uh, and that would make up for the difference for what, what we're, we're showing. Sure I'm sorry, could you go over that? So where are those? T1 through T13. Oh, are in front of the... Those are, the existing stalls are uh -huh. 90 degrees to the wall, so these would be... Uh, perpendicular. Yeah, yeah, perpendicular to them. So one car would, would block a couple of spaces and so forth mm -hmm. on, the, on down the line. Okay. And those would be managed by uh, attendees. A question about the parking. Um, it wasn't clear to me, like, how will the valet parking work? What at what point will you yeah, trigger valet parking? Agreed. Who will do the valet parking? Is there will enough staff there? People, what, what's going to happen there? Because that's exactly my, my biggest concern. I mean, if it's just going to be someone kind of going out and moving cars, it's a lot different than someone at the ready. So, yeah, we had put there, I believe, in the letter, I sorry, what the um. 80% If the hotel hits a certain occupancy, that would trigger uh, putting in the valet into um, process. We have, we have people working at the hotel around the clock at the hotel. There's always desk attendants, assistant desk attendants, people working there. So that's why we felt 80% would be a number where we could start, after tracking the parking history, we could start to possibly use the spots and we need to use the tandem assisted or valet parking. So it, it, once it reaches 80% occupancy, the conditions in the special permit require that you institute a valet program that then parks all of the spaces as valet. All of the I, I just don't see how practically that works. I mean, sometimes you're going to valet and sometimes once you're reach, not. Once, it, once you reach 80% occupancy, you have to go valet. Irrespective of whether they have cars or not. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're going to ask everyone for their keys when yeah. they check in, no matter whether you're at eighty percent or not, because you're not going to know. Right. So, so yeah. oh no, we'll know because um, we're on the Hilton reservation system. So, you know, we'll be able to look out uh, weekly in advance what our reservations look like. We'll have history of monitoring room stays and room nights. So, our staff will be able to know. Okay, guys, we're approaching that eighty percent. You know, time to trigger the valet. So we'll we'll know well in advance. We we, you know, it won't be one of these instances where you know one night all of a sudden we hit eighty percent and we're scrambling for valets. And we'll we'll have a good sense of where we're looking on occupancy each day because we project every day for occupancy, and uh, we'll be able to react quickly to that. And and, and based on the history. It, do they have the history of the occupancy levels? Yes. Yeah. I'm actually looking, and so I guess I, I guess something that triggered something, and do you mind if I? Yeah, go ahead. So um, something that triggered is, is, Mary, I think you said they've been telling people not to park in the parking lot lately. And if you look, and this is just anecdotal because, frankly, I, I haven't done the math until as I was sitting right here. If you look at June 2015, well, first off, I'd like to understand how the how all of this was done to begin with. How was the audit done? Uh, we'll send whoever's working the desk that evening through 11 p.m. when most okay. of the guests, if not all the guests, have arrived to walk through and do a physical account. But you don't know that people didn't park in the other lots. I mean, so there you, until recently, you haven't said don't park in the Marley. No, no, uh, no, October. Lot. 
we had our when was the first meeting October yeah October of 2014 is when the, okay. the one of the ladies in the neighborhood mentioned that okay so they've been telling people since October 2014 because I look at June of 2015 and you know you're near capacity on parking especially let, let me put it a different way if you go up by 20 percent in rooms which is what you're doing okay you're gonna be in I think it's at least 14 of the 24 days that are just in June, you would have needed to be in the tandem parking. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I guess I'm just a little bit nervous about the notion of kind of an ad hoc um, valet um, in this situation. Because I think, um, yeah, because, because, I think it's easy for people to park in Marley and come on, you know, so I guess I'm just a little bit concerned on that. Um, one, one, one thing to keep in mind, sorry to interrupt, is for us, guest satisfaction is very important. So what we can have is people not having a place to park. So, that, you know, for us, we've got we've to watch this closely. And uh, June is, is probably our busiest time of the year. Um, uh, April, May, and June are, are really our busiest time. Um, but for us, we've, we've got to stay on top of this because if our guests come to our hotel and can't park, they're not coming back. So for us, in terms of valet, I mean, that's something we'll, we, we're going we're gonna to be able to monitor, we're going to be able to project out, and we're not going to wait you know, until we're 80% to institute it. We'll be ready so that if there's a chance we hit 80% that night, we'll have our team ready to, ready to go. Okay. Could you, oh, could you explain for me how this would work if I'm a guest at the hotel and we're in a valet scenario? Do I just, where do I drive up? Where do I meet somebody to park the car? What am I doing? Well, there, there, is, there is a quarter to share um, kind of, well, there's no port of shape, but there's, there's a pull up right in front of the hotel where you just pull up and, and, and you stop there. We'd have a valet attendant there. That's usually where to a bellman, although I don't know, a lot of times it's all like self-service. Uh, usually what a lot of times happen is people will pull up and they'll either unload their, their, their bags or unload people, you know, yeah. uh, family will go into the hotel or they'll pull down into the garage and we do have a... Um, elevator on the first floor of the garage that takes you up to the hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. So when I drive the car, I, 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 I stop at, outside the lobby, let off the bags, let off the passengers, I then would continue driving into the garage and there would be a valet person to meet me there? Or do I just leave it outside and go into the front desk and say, here's the keys? How, how, how does that work? No, there'd be a valet attendant. They would be a valet attendant. So they, they, the we, would, we would either station them in the garage so the yep. guests can pull down into the garage, okay. or they would be stationed right there at the front door. There would, would have to be signage mm -hmm. up front, um, you know, directing people what to do when this was in place. Yeah, yeah. Because you also need to make sure that you've got a place, you know, a comment area for where the exactly. keys are stored exactly. so that you exactly. know which yeah. keys belong to which car. Yeah, and pretty typical of a hotel operation. And, and if I do remember, right. I'm just sort of thinking about if you go into a stairs. private parking garage, you know, there's when you pull into the garage, that's the spot where the attendant meets you right. and asks you how long you're going to stay, right. and uh, then you surrender the keys and and uh, hope you find your vehicle a few hours later. <laughs> Kidding about that. Um, I, had, I did have a question. Uh, back to the plan for just a second. Um, if I understand, I mean, and, and we've got, yeah, the parking plan. Thank you. Uh, so we've got the top portion is really just a segment of the portion at the bottom because the parking spaces begin with parking space four yes. on the left hand side. So one, two, and three are Down off the, the page. Center. Yes, they're down this end, so yeah. we're cut off. This piece is sort of cut off right about here. So we're, we are missing the tail end just to Okay, the and then, yeah. right, because that's where 1, 2, 3, and then 39, 40, and 41 would be, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mary, I agree with your count about the outdoor parking number. I think you're right on that. 
Um, I do have, it's sort of a dimensional issue though, on the parking aisle, that needs to be 24 feet, which we could reduce down to 80%, correct? Under our authority for a, a special permit. But your parking aisle with the tandem spaces is only 16 feet. Well, I think that you can make an exception under 812C. If I pull that out and I look at that, if reasonable alternative measures have been taken to meet the intent of these standards, minimize traffic congestion entering mm -hmm. within parking lots, I think that gives you the ability um, to make that exception for the valeting of cars. Um, I also note, and you probably remember from the original decision, there was a provision in there that the uh, Burkhardt agreed to use a valet service to mitigate um, traffic congestion. I don't know if you remember that. That's on page, the, that's under section 1011A3, the condition. Um, the petitioner is also committed to provide valet parking to accommodate additional automobiles if further mitigation is necessary. Halfway down the page in the, in the decision from 1998. Well, I want to go back to what you just said about Section 812C mm -hmm. that allows conditions to be modified to increase capacity if the following conditions are met. Mm -hmm. And for the sake of argument, I'll agree that they've been met. But that's, you've got a very specific provision in 812A10 that says, Special permit granting authority may grant a special permit to allow the reduction of the parking space requirements to 80% of that required in the table of off-street parking regulations where conditions unique to the use will reasonably justify such a reduction. And I think it's been consistent with the board that we've always said, if you're talking about the count of parking spaces, it's that 80% number. I've never heard someone, for example, argue that under 812C, we could reduce the parking spaces down to 50% or 70%. And I'm willing to read this section, 812A10, where it says parking space requirements would apply not just to count, but to dimensional requirements. But I just can't get myself down. I mean, 80% of 24 feet is 19 something for the aisle, for the parking aisle. I don't see how you get well, to 16. Well, can I ask a question about and, that? Yeah, go ahead. In the case that they're using a valet situation, which would go limit the, limit the thing to mm -hmm. 16 feet, that's 100% valet operation. I, I don't know that it is. So, so that's where I'm kind of perplexed by the whole thing. Because, because I, think, I think what happens is, and you know, I, fine if you want to say that you know you know your reservations and everything else but you don't know who's parking where you know two days before leaving their car and getting around town who's got a four-day reservation so you didn't necessarily take that person's keys right so that person all of a sudden is parked in one of those spots over there right and comes out to get his car and there's a tandem you know it, it, it sounds, like a, it sounds like a it sounds like a like a mess. I, to I don't me. think so. I, I don't agree, but maybe you can explain. Or you could say if you park on the spot that isn't tandem, is the self parking portion. Yeah, but the, the problem is it's talking about the drive on. Yeah, it's dimensional. Oh, oh, I can't the, do anything. At the end, at the end of the day, we we're in the hospitality business. These folks have to have a positive guest experience. In fact, if they don't, what happens is is they report to Hilton, because many of these stays are Hilton rewards. So if Hilton, once Hilton starts getting bad reports, then the, the, the actual flag, the, the franchise becomes in jeopardy. So we've got a monitoring of Hilton on this as well, but we're in the hospitality business. If these folks are coming here and they can't get their car, they're not coming back, and, and we're going to lose a lot of business. So, I, I, you know. So, doesn't it make sense to have valet on all the time? Not from an operating standpoint, because if we're 20, 30, 40, 50 percent occupied, it, to, to, to absorb that cost is not feasible. Mm -hmm. But believe me. But looking at the numbers, it looks like that's not the case. It's, it's, 
when, when you look at the numbers based on our occupancy, when we what we ran 71 room nights last year at 100% occupancy, and we used how many parking spots? Let's go that further than that, but at 100%, so it's 77, 78% of the spots. I mean, so, yeah. So so we ran 171 rooms last year, 71 room nights. We were full, sold out, and we used. 70, how many percent, Ned? 78%. 78% of the spots. Can I ask a, qu a question from the other side for a second? How many spaces are you counting on outside? Fourteen. Okay, where, where are those spaces? Those where are those spaces? Yeah, where, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, sure, right here. Let me just ask the question. Right there and there and there. Okay, okay, so they're outside. Yeah. So you have 14 spaces outside. And those spaces can be used for anything. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, will there be any other spaces that you use outside of the 14, outside the building? No. How do you know that other spaces won't be used in that, in other parts? Would you be able to... There are no other parking spaces outside on the side. But they can park out in the parking lot somewhere and not on your property. They could park on someone else's property. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you... You have to police that in some way, saying hotel guests will park only on the hotel. Well, that when they check in, they ask you okay. if you have a car. And there's signage as well on the way in. Okay, so what I'm working back, guys, on this is saying, these guys are running a hotel with largely an interior garage. They're going to manage it in the best way they possibly can. They're, they're, this is not impacting outside of... This is not like a business where suddenly they're going to be parking across the street, they're going to be parking in somebody else's lot. They have to manage this valet parking operation themselves. You know, I could see different ways to operate it. You might sequester one side of the garage and let the left side be, be self-park. It depends on how your business is working. If it's so successful that it's all valet, then that's your problem. You're going to be you're going to be not running it like a, a low-end hotel. You're going to be running it like more like a mid-level hotel where you have valet. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering why, what what the end game of the argument against it is. I mean, I see it adding up to them actually providing. I I think by providing a, a good parking operation that stays within their own site. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I guess I get a. I get a little concerned that, you know, that's another cost and there's parking out in the other parking lot. And then all of a sudden there's a natural tendency for, you know, someone to go into the parking lot, see there's no parking, see this other parking lot over here and just park. Now they may not be happy guests at that point or anything else, but you may never know it. And that parking lot's already a mess. The Marley parking lot already has basic overuse with, you know, the gym, the CVS and everything else. And I'm just afraid that this is going to cause, um, you know, more stress on that already stressed piece of property. There'd be no charge for this, though. No, and I understand. Yeah. I, I understand all of that. But I also know what I do as a guest. And I'm going to just, do I really want to give my key to you? Or do I want to just go park somewhere and come in? So, you know, it's it, it lends itself to... It's not the best plan I've heard. But when you look ask. at the data, when you look at the data, mm -hmm. and the data shows that we had 70, one, 78 room nights that were 100% sold out, and we didn't use all our parking. And that's simple data. That's plain data. Yeah, and, and I guess I, I, I hear you, but it seems to me that's rising at least from, from where, what I'm looking at, that if you're at 100%, before it looked like you were around 66 cars, you know, you were around 63 cars, but, you know, in June, you're at 100%, you're doing 78, 80, 73, 74, you're well above 70 in, in like I said, 14 out of the 24 days. Mm -hmm. um, that translates into, if you just multiply it by, you know, 1.2, you're upping it by 20%, you're above the 88 that you have for basically all of those 14 days. Well, maybe the, the, the response to that is that in the months that there's a clear pattern of more uh, cars, graduations, whatever the case may be, 
to yeah. have a higher, a lower trigger for the valet. Um, and the months, the quieter months, the winter months. So, for instance, maybe it's 70 percent um, for the months of the busy months, April, May, and June. Uh, 80 percent for the other months. I mean, this is, you know, this this is a franchisee of Hilton. Um, this is not um, someone, you know, a, a small operator. Uh, they have a vested interest in making sure. And frankly, I know the board puts in all the decisions that you retain jurisdiction. Um, you could always bring it back and say, hey, we have some concerns. We're going to make it 60% if um, we're, we're not happy with what's going on now. There's all, you always retain that jurisdiction. The other thing is, um, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that there has been some increased policing of the Marley parking lot because there should be no parking in that lot after when the Monotony Grove closes. So um, I believe that they've been towing. So any guest that parks there is going to have a very unpleasant experience. It, outside parking spaces, are, is there signage outside that say that is solely for guests of uh, the hotel? Yes, yeah. there is. Okay. As well as um, when you enter the property, all hotel guests can use the garage. So yeah. we encourage the garage okay. as much as possible. Lit sign. In regard to the um, representations about capacity, you know, I think that I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I understand that you know a significant portion of the guests may be arriving by cab, by livery service, public transportation. But even with your own audit, there are some nights where it's down to zero. I mean, in terms of empty spaces, you, you have maxed it out. Um, so I don't know. I mean. The other thing is, as much as you can say, well, we're, we're, we're not hitting capacity very often, the problem for, the, I think, that the board faces is, is, you know, the bylaw is there. I mean, you know, we've got certain flexibility. We can reduce these requirements down to 80%. I don't, I don't really see that we've got the ability to add what attorney when Stanley O'Connor is suggesting that we can then take A12C and reduce it further. Frankly, I'm not quite sure what A12C really is meant to speak to if there's a specific reference in the A12A that says we can do 80%. Well, I think, Bruce, if you look at um, Section 8, how could you read stacked spaces? Well, it doesn't, it's not defined. I'm willing right, to, but, I, how, I, how, but I, you know, I, I went, you know, to, uh, just various definitions that I've found on the internet. A lot of the stacked space diagrams and, and images and so on refer to ones that have mechanical lifts, but I'm uh, prepared to accept that it doesn't have to be that way. It can be any parking arrangement where valets are able to move cars so you have more cars in right. the parking garage right. Right. than there are spaces yeah. to maneuver them around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You should just say valet, don't yeah. call it stack. No, well, stack is a, a, a term of art in the parking right. Whatever. business. Whatever. So Whatever. I, I'm prepared to accept the petitioner's definition of stack spaces. It's interesting that the uh, parking article, Article 8, only refers to par stack spaces in that one spot in 812A where it's talking about the dimensional requirements of the stack space, which, by the way, are greater than what you're showing on the plan. The stack space has to be 8.5 by 22, except for the end space where you could move, move the car in from uh, either end. Uh, and I think you're showing 8.5 by 17. So, but you've got room right. here to play with right, that. Right. So I don't think that's a fatal flaw. That can be addressed. The, the, the flaw that I just can't get around is the aisle. Well, but I, I don't think you need that size drive aisle in a valet situation. It doesn't. Well, I, you know, I mean, that's... I mean, you're, you need that size of a drive aisle, in, drive aisle, in my opinion, if you've got public moving these things around, mm -hmm. which would be the case if you weren't tandem stacking them for the valet. I, and I honestly, Bruce, I don't know how you'd read 812C otherwise when it says maybe modified to increase capacity for park lines. Um, and I, I would yeah, argue that that's to increase the number of vehicles. Then why do we have the uh, direct language in 812A10 that says because, we can only go to 80%? Because you know that bylaws are not perfect things. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. 
So now I go back to there. You're worried that they won't have enough room to create a valet operation in there. I'm. What I'm saying is that it's it's the petitioner is using 812C to increase the number of parking spaces. Let me try it a different way. Yeah. If they put, if if through the cost of the valet operation, yeah, yeah, which is a business cost to them, they increase the amount of parking within a smaller area, mm -hmm. thus not spilling out into other areas. And I would argue that there has to be something in place to say there's no hotel parker parking anywhere else but on their site yeah. on penalty of something. If they do all that, they are actually doing a good thing for our town, in effect. They are mm -hmm. reducing the amount of space used for parking. They're reducing the demand on asphalt for parking. They're being more efficient with parking. So a valet operation, which is very rare, you're not gonna, you're not, the town's not going to have a valet operation, but a private business can be allowed to have a private, to, to have a valet operation which would benefit the overall parking demand. So I'm not sure. That I see the bylaw, does the bylaw control dimensional aspects of valet parking in a private institution? Maybe it does. I have to work my way around, but. But I see the bigger picture of it actually benefiting the, you know, the parking conditions. There. Yeah, I guess you know I'm reading 8.12c to talk about, you know, all these other things that we have in in parking areas. For example, you know the size of landscaping in the parking lot, and you know if you have mm -hmm. a uh, outside parking lot, you know the landscaping just can't be a, a buffer around the outside. You've got you know some. Uh, Areas, islands inside the asphalt that are, uh, right. you know, green space. Um, yep. we're Dimensional, dimension of park. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, I just haven't seen it. Because I don't think we've ever really interpreted the bylaw to say that H12C can reduce the width of the of the of the, uh, of the aisle. Did, did we ever interpret it to allow the valet park? That's a good question. I don't know if we have. I don't think we have. Because that, that's overrides in a Except the special way. permit that uh, Mary, you mentioned. The same special permit talks mm -hmm. about valet parking. It talks about putting more cars in there, frankly. That's really what the, I interpret that What's, as being. What special permit? The special permit for the site. The current one. Yeah. Now, I did run this by Mr. Byrne. I sat down. Um, I met with Ms. Kowalski, and I met with Mr. Byrne separately. And um, I told him my, gave him my reading of that section, and he thought that was plausible. Um, Plausible so. Did you ask him specifically about the width of the aisle? No, I didn't ask him about the width of the aisle. Okay. I asked him about doing the stack parking in the garage. Okay. That I did not ask him. But I, I see that as a, and that can be definitely distinguished. All right. We just make one comment about the aisle width. It, it, your bylaw allows for, for parallel spaces 12 foot width, so 16. Is more than adequate for a valet parker for attendee uh, parking on a parallel basis of a 16 foot aisle. It exceeds the minimum by four feet. And they would be moving the cars for the 90 degree stalls to let them in and out. You'd have the full access uh, to the full 24 feet uh, if someone were parked at a 90 degree nose in stall and needed to, uh, needed to uh, exit the. That's exit if the it's only a one way aisle. What's that? That's only if it's a one-way aisle. So if you're reading from 812, 813, yeah. yeah, that says that if it's a two-way aisle, it's 24 feet. If it's one-way traffic only, then you get the parallel 30 degree, 45 degree. But, but if we're valeting, there's only one person mm -hmm. driving. We'll be parking nose in or rear in 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. I guess if we're unattended, it would be a problem, but where it's... Where if, it, if it is valet, then okay. They're, they're only moving one car at a time. Yeah. And I guess I'm just back to the next concern about when is the valet in operation. So what was the original valet? Um, it, was, it was a very general statement. 
Uh, I'll read you that. The petitioner has requested a reduction on the required parking spaces to 80% of that required or 84 spaces. His justification is that the site is served by mass transit. Average hotel occupancy in Greater Boston is only 75%. Occupants of multiple rooms may come in one car, and out-of-state visitors will come in and transfer to the hotel by taxi or limousine. The petitioner has also committed to provide valet parking to accommodate additional automobiles if further mitigation is necessary. So I would suggest to you that if it was more than 84, the, the board that decided this decision understood that they'd be valeted in the garage. Can I add one more thing? Um, we're currently uh, under construction on a hotel in Brookline. It's a home with suites. It has 130 rooms. Similar situation, we have an underground garage. The parking ratio there is 0.5. And we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be making that type of investment if we weren't comfortable with the parking ratio. Bless you. Bless you. So, so um, I guess that's why I, I think. I, I guess the, the. I don't think any of you were sat in on that decision, 1998. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, uh, they contemplated that there would be more than 84 cars. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a way, Mike, to address it. You know, maybe it's a lower percentage um, in, the, in the busier months. And based on the information they already have, they know they have to have a valet pretty much every day for April, May, and June. And if it's preventing them from parking off-site, because bottom line, if a business can operate themselves, why do we care? Unless they spill over or affect outside of their property, why in a way does it matter as long as it, may, it forces them to be more efficient? Why does it matter? in a valet situation. I'm curious why. I, I'm just, I mean, valet is... It's not a good thing is what I'm saying. To yeah. Be more efficient. Yeah, no, I think it is. To be more efficient is always a good thing. However, uh, it, it does become a little bit of an enforcement issue, right? I mean, like, we'll, we'll never know. And I we'll think never know whether people are parking off. -site. We don't know whether they're actually doing the valet. When well, they're it supposed doesn't matter to be. whether they're doing valet or not. They're parking on their own site. All that matters is they're not affecting. But I mean, if they're not doing the valet, then I think the repercussions are is that they. That That's the crux of the question. But the, but in, I mean, Mike Byrne isn't going to check out valet parking. Or and it becomes self-policing, so, doesn't it? I, yeah. I mean, the it's, other it's, businesses, I would. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I feel like the other businesses would would start to correct. Presently, are self-policing, and I think they would continue to do that. Yeah. We know there are CVS signs. They're letting people know they, they keep these for CVS customers. Uh, whether that's part of the plan or not, uh, that's one way that the existing tenants on the uh, abutting property are trying to keep those spaces <coughs> rotating for yeah. customers to other businesses. Now, we'll come in, and they can put a sign. If you park on, um, if you park on this other site, you will be towed. There's ways to address it. Mm -hmm. I, I do a lot of traveling, and when I see signs like that, I don't even take the risk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. No one wants to. Hotel guests must park on site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the only danger is that there's a spillover. And I think you can tell, you know, the two meetings, can be, the community neighborhood meetings, were very positive, and I think you can see from the response to that, I mean, the neighbors are feeling satisfied. Um, why was the basketball court put in there? Is that a public accommodation? Um, it's a requirement by Hilton. Well, it was supposed to be a swimming pool, but if you remember, Mr. Marley appealed the decision of this board, and Burkhardt, I can tell you because I had represented him at the time, Burkhardt agreed to take the swimming pool out. Uh, you people put the basketball court in, right? Yeah. What was it before? Nothing. I don't think there was anything back there. I mean, the hotel, when it was originally built, was very beer bomb. I was shocked when I went and saw what a beautiful job they'd done in it. Oh, 
I did have a question about um, the bicycle parking. Um, it's just it's a computation question. So if you you're going to wind up with 97 spaces, you need a bicycle space for every 15 parking spaces. So 15 goes into 97 six and almost a half times. It's a rounding up for bicycle, so you actually need seven. Do you have yeah. bicycle space? We have space before now, but uh, I can find the space that I put in here. Okay. <coughs> Well, you know, when you yeah. open up a whole, you're right on the bike path. You're going to open up a whole new uh, uh, niche. schedule, hours, and if there's somebody we can connect with the uh, development team if there's an issue, just take that into consider during construction phase. Yeah, I don't think there would be any off, you know, normal work hour construction <coughs> going on, nothing at night, okay. like that. Um, just, I'm involved with construction. I know, I, I'm very familiar with hotel building. Sure, uh, we'd be happy to connect you to the right person. Okay. Straight, straight shot. shot down. So you take a jog to the left, yeah. and, and this jog already shot. does exist. Here's the gotcha. seven rooms. It's just that it ends at the uh, yeah, emergency exit. Yeah, existing stairs now. And then you come down here. Yeah. At the entry level, is the lobby here? No. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> right here. You can see that uh, oh, entry <coughs> you drop off here, and you continue on, and you go into the garage here. So the lobby's right here. Okay, and that's a drop. Yeah, this would just give you an idea of perspective of the room size and things like that, really, and then laid on top of the site plan. So, yeah, lots of mass over here. Yeah. Currently, for the outdoor spaces that you said are marked for hotel guest use only, is that uh, by means of uh, signage or is it printed on the pavement? Uh, how's that? Denoted. The outdoor space, we have a um, we have a area outside that faces um, Mass Ave that you can only really get to by going through the lobby. I mean, there are emergency exits, but it's contained by fence and things like that. Um, as far as signs, it says uh, not up to the public. I don't believe there is. We don't have an issue with. But you have your own for the parking spaces. In. Oh, for the outdoor parking spaces, the I'm 14 sorry. that are out outside just to discourage people who might be visiting the other businesses. Oh, yeah, each sign right here in these exterior spots, they're uh, podium signs that say uh, these spots are used for Hilton Homewood Suite guests only. Uh -huh. It does exist now. Okay. And am I wrong? But I think you've got your own drive down there, right? Isn't there a physical separation between? It's shared. It's, 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 it's it is not shared? physically separated. Okay, I thought you it was can, for some can reason. Drive between the two. Between the two. Yeah, 
I guess I was thinking of it more. Okay. But you're on the other side of monotony coming in. You're on the right. And then, yeah. right. And then I see you come back out. to managing the valet parking. So if you reach that trigger where valet parking goes into effect and you have guests who have already parked in these interior, well, okay, I, I guess, but you're only talking about moving the yeah. tandem spaces so that you could open that up to get somebody on the, on the interior housing. Yeah, those okay. tandem spots would be the last spots you'd use, so the uh, valet would have control of that point. Mm -hmm. And presumably, okay. your front desk person's asking someone as they come down, "Are you parked in the garage?" Right, and are you in a? Right. In a did the valet park your car? Yeah. Yeah. So if not, the valet's probably going out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, is, is your other project that's a point five, the one you mentioned, is that valet? No, no, self park. This is this is what this was nice. <laughs> this would be ninety-seven spots for one hundred twenty-one. So that would be what what percentage? I can't do it in my head without it. Yeah, it's about eighty percent. So it's at a higher percentage than the other one that doesn't even contemplate that one. Eighty percent. Eighty-one percent. And we don't have valet. Situation that's going to be one direction only. Yeah. So, even, so maybe if, you've got the 12 I, instead of the 24. Right. Even if I haven't quite embraced that rationale, I, I can see that um, I can apply this the 12. parallel. The right. 12 feet. Yeah. So, no, I, I, I'm coming around. Yeah. to the user reason just such a reduction. So we can move it down to 80%, right? Okay. Then you get this whole thing. It's standards of the whole thing. Maybe modified to increase capacity of parking lots. So both the final additional staff that one and two. Okay, which don't really have anything to do with the other things. Yeah. And my point was is I don't think that's kind of decreasing the, the I don't think it's saying you can go below the 80 there. Mm -hmm. But I think what it's saying is that the space you have can be used more efficiently to meet the 80 percent. Mm -hmm. Reason, uh, reasonable alternative measures have been taken to meet the intent of these standards, which minimize traffic congestion. Then parking lots separate parking lots from pedestrian space for an adequate drainage. Screen. Yeah, I think I'm getting that. Yeah, if, to address your issue about mm -hmm. potential spillover. <coughs> suggestion that you need to address how to create management <coughs> that would in no way endanger the, you know, no, no way increase the back managing 
maybe allay some of the issues because mm -hmm. I still been arguing that um, it's actually you're creating a more efficient parking situation by as long as it doesn't spill over. Right. And I do believe your numbers and your and your business model. I, I can believe what you're telling me that it's actually working that way. Um, so in that case, I don't see that. I think if you were able to apply such measures and they were able to be monitored or checked in some way, then that would be some put a condition that could be. Put together some guidelines for the board to how to do that. I mean, I, I will tell you that um, it's helpful to my client that it's over $100 a day to rent a car to come from Logan Airport. So it's cheaper take a taxi um, to the site or to take a livery service. Um, if we were out in Franklin, Tennessee, you know, this would be a different issue. But the, the economics of it makes it more likely that people are using other alternative means to get to the site because of the excessive cost of renting a vehicle and, of course, of driving a Boston. But we can come up with some guidelines of what percentage, um, what they will post for signage to tell other people who you know, you have to um, check in at the hotel and park in the garage, park in the valley. We can put all that together for the so. yeah, you, you, you have to give your, which is what you do anyway, give your license plate and so forth. The type car you're driving. Yep. So you're going to be monitored. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know who you are. You can't, uh, you can't park other than on the side. You could create a form as well with this on. Told if you park <coughs> anywhere other than a hotel park. park. And that, that's standard when you check in at hotels. We put something together. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a hybrid situation. I mean, it's not a. It's not out in the middle of something where it's parking all around. And yeah, right. that's what you're expecting because you're pulling up on the highway and you just. It's a little bit different because it's a town facility, not facility, but it's a different kind of a hotel model. It's just you have to get yeah. used to the fact that they're actually able to make money with, with a, a valet situation and less percentage of cars. And Does, is there any space to host outside events or the people who aren't guests coming in? No, they, they don't do that. would be one of the conditions they would agree to, mm -hmm. that there would be no public use. I can tell you when Burkhardt owned it, they used to rent the front room because the Zonta Club in Arlington, we used to go there and have meetings. Right. That is not the case with the Hilton Group. Okay. Um, you can't even go in and get a cup of coffee unless you're a hotel There's guest. There's absolutely no yeah. And I think that's a little bit. I know this is, in, in, yeah. yeah, well, it said that there was no restaurant right. access. Right. I didn't know if they were outside. No, no. Small the boardroom, the board room, which was a meeting room, was taken out. Right, okay. Yeah. Because that would tip the scales. Yeah. And no. you've got people coming yeah. out. No, that's not the case. I just to make sure that that was clear. It's also much easier to get to Alewife on foot now than it was when they first built it because you can see our greenway. So I don't know if more people do make your guests aware of that, that they can have it walk to Alewife Station. Yeah, you get guests that's, that that's way. That's a big selling point for us with, yeah. with the uh, Alewife right there. People take it into Boston. They walk or they cab it from the uh, Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Well, a lot of the Cambridge businesses pick people up. Yeah. Oh, nice. Like those BMD shuttles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you guys? And have we a have a bus. I'm sorry. We have a bus stop right there as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have a shuttle? Pro Do you have a shuttle no. to the airway? No. It's not a bad idea. If you get enough. I don't think they get that much demand. That's right. Take the shuttle to the hotel and then get on the bus on Broadway because sometimes it's quicker. <laughs> percentage that triggers the valet requirement? Right percentage of the hotel <coughs> the institution of the valet service. Are you okay with the blended approach of the busy months, say 70%, and the other months, the quieter months, 80%? Yeah, I think that I am. I, mean, I, I can get there. The board. No, I can get there. Yeah. That's good. 
And then the, just for clarity, the busy months are May, June, or April, May, June? Is that? Yeah, it's graduation. Yes. Graduation, yeah. 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 I've got a few ideas for special conditions, so I'll, I'll just um, throw these out here for the members to consider. So, uh, the, in addition to the applicant will include bicycle parking for seven bicycles, the applicant will require or institute valet parking <coughs> at applicant's cost. When the hotel occupancy rate exceeds 80% of capacity, except in the months of April, May, and June, when the valet parking would institute when the occupancy rate exceeds 70% of capacity. Um, when valet parking is in effect, no guest will be allowed to park vehicles themselves in the garage. The tandem parking spaces shown on the garage level parking exhibit prepared by H.W. Moore may only be used when valet parking is in effect. I'm uh, sorry, Bruce, would you yep. mind repeating that last one? Sure. The tandem <coughs> parking spaces shown on the garage level parking exhibit prepared by H.W. Moore Associates may only be used when valet parking is in effect. shall provide the board with an operation plan. with a yeah pro proper uh, parking management plan yes. that would discourage guests from parking off-site of the hotel property for example uh, warnings of possible towing mm -hmm. um, aside from Hotel guest use of a hotel, there will be no other public use of a hotel, for example, conference room, meeting room, uh, or uh, food service. <coughs> and that would accept the food service that you have now for the which is just for continental breakfast and afternoon right, tea yes. and cookies and things like that. Yeah. Uh, That's all I had. And then, of course, compliance with the Comic Con. Yes. Right. And I guess that. Yeah, well, we can put that in the special permit, but that does sort of stand alone with mm -hmm. the. Well, and I think it's Con also reflected in the plans, aren't they? Yes. So it built accordingly. <coughs> self-parking when the valet services are required. Um, as well as the ones you said, we could, well, what we could do is we could accept their, their condition with your modification, you know, the May and June 70%, and then still add <coughs> bicycles and your parking management for you to cover everything you did. Okay. And if you just, the petitioner poses a condition in that last paragraph. Oh. There. If, if you just amend that with your 70%, then you picked up all of the, and you said, um, I think, though, in, in the letter, uh, it, we, we've now determined that there need to be 13 parking spaces uh, okay. for valet parking, where it says 12. I think Carol got the whole thing. I think, it, okay. I think we've covered everything. Good, my guess. Yeah. Plus, also that it's built to 
Right. Approved funds. Yeah. The draft um, condition, the only special condition is um, six bicycle um, parking spaces, but I want to be sure, is that the number that is to be added? I thought it was four. Oh, because okay. there's three now. Three now. There's, there's four. Four. four now. So three additional. Three additional. Yeah. Okay. Four, a total of seven. You just said something I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That wouldn't be the first time this board heard that. Just conversation. So just conversation. You want to throw that <laughs> yeah, it's okay with me. I'll uh, I'll move to approve uh, the plans presented with the special conditions um, that were enumerated um, by Bruce. I'll second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Good luck. Thank you. to the Master Plan Implementation Committee. Now we get to take a step back from this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I put forward on the other one. <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? I we think can have a duel. A duel. A duel. Um, <laughs> it's a worthy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 
bring it around. <laughs> well right done. Yeah, yeah, well said done it was a right. draw. Oh, man, this is well good. Well done is right. <laughs> I, I, I would be willing to jump onto that one if you're not. I could do it, depending on the schedule. Do you want to do a, a, a co? Do a co seat? Can we do that? Uh, I don't see why not. This isn't. Um, you may want to. You may. Or a, a, a designated or yeah. an alternate. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe more that way. Okay, let's do that. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think, so. I think yeah. so. Let's do it that way. So I'll volunteer with Andy as the alternate. That sounds good. Okay, I'll move that. So we can have this discussion before Mike volunteer. Hey, well, I, I, yeah, exactly. I'll I could use an alternate. That. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll move uh, that Andrew Bunnell is the uh, designee, uh, the re redevelopment board member designee for the master plan. Implementation Committee with Andy West to be an alternate. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And um, the ARB appointees also. Right, Carol? Oh, we need to do those, yes. Yeah. Do you have or don't we have them already? This thing but don't we need to, we probably oh, need to oh, approve oh, them. Oh, okay. So I'll move to approve. Um, Joe Barr and Wendy Richter as the uh, Arlington Redevelopment Boy Board appointees to the Master Plan Implementation Committee. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Both Thanks. of them were on the um, yep. Master Plan. Yeah, I remember. Who seconded? I'm sorry. I did, Bruce. Thank you. Now, so long as I'm not the CPA committee member who ends up on this board, <laughs> I gotta make sure I attend. I gotta attend that meeting. Okay. I'll just jump to the right to the next one. If yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You don't mind. Um, the the next agenda item is related to the interest, um, the, the objective of trying to move towards electronic meeting packets electronic, um, giving you the ability to um, have a, a tablet in front of you with your selectmen and um, I believe the school committee has done. Uh, the IT strategic plan does include um, this uh, item of having the board go in this direction. It will um, require that we also eventually work towards having applicants submit plans like this electronically. You would have to do a lot of scrolling because these are large, but uh, it, it is done. Uh, so it's, it's a, it sounds very simple, but it, it's a, an interconnected task. Um, so the reason this is on the agenda is I just want to see if I can give you enough information and, and answer enough questions so that we can get a general sense that is this a direction or, or do you support this and do you think this would be practical and beneficial to the idea is it will reduce paper we hope but we also think that once this starts it will be easier to keep a database of the special permits the conditions the plans and to be able to search conditions so that you, if you want to search uh, where do, have we uh, made parking um, exceptions, for lack of better words, where do we have public access? We don't know right now. I don't think you <coughs> could necessarily do a quick search. You would have to go to some degree by institutional memory in the staff, look through all of the hard copy files. Some of the addresses have quite a, a um, large file because it's been amended so many times over the years. So there's some real advantages to going this route. Um, once you start, everything is electronic henceforth, and everything from that moment back would have to be, at some point, scanned and added to the database. That's a whole separate task. So this is, um, that's the general gist of this, uh, an early step in this process would be um, just getting the board tablets to use uh, during the meetings and also getting a scanner so that if we do have large format plans during a transition period, we could scan them for the board so that you could use them 
that way. So is this something that you feel ready to do? I think so. Um, I think, th I, I guess the only thing is, and, and this is me being a little bit of a Luddite, is um, uh, with respect to comments and that type of, I mean, I think we all take everything we have and just start making notes and everything else. I mean, obviously on a PDF, if you've got uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro or something like that, you can make those types of comments. If you only have Reader or something like that, it becomes a lot more difficult That's a good to take point. notes and that type of thing. So, so I, I, think, I think there can be drawbacks depending upon um, what it is. So I, I think that's the only thing I'd point out there. Uh, I'd like to see if we can get information from the other um, boards how they're dealing on, on with it. What, how they're addressing that. That's yeah. a legitimate concern. I think the one of the things that makes our board different from most other boards in town is how much we use plans. Mm -hmm. And getting that to fit on a tablet, you're going to have to shrink it down so much that you're going to lose dimensions and you know, some or of the other you're gonna be looking at this, or, or you're gonna be looking at twelve different yeah. pages to see one plan. So that would be, I think, <coughs> my only concern. I think a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's text. It's it could all, be you know, all that kind of stuff. But but I would not want to do away with mm -hmm. the uh, the paper plans because yeah. plus I don't know. I mean, it's I just my generation. I see things better on that than I do on the time, on, on, a, on a screen. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think that we would continue to expect one um, full role set um, for the meeting. Mm -hmm. I also think it might be something for us to consider and discuss um, with the uh, IT department uh, whether we could get a, a screen in here and um, be able to display Project. these. Mm -hmm. In fact, that. That might actually be an improvement yeah. right now, just because of the physical layout. Very often when the board is um, looking at the plan with an applicant, the, um, the abutters don't know right. what, what we're talking about. about. <coughs> so, <coughs> shortcoming. so if it were up on, on a wall or a screen where everyone can see it, that could be an improvement. So let me make a note um, to get you some information on how the other boards are um, making notes and comments and also um, the large display of rule plans. And any other means to um, be able to continue to use a set of large role plans. Do you feel that when you're at home, your reduced set is sufficient, or do you still, now you probably have a, an impulse to scale things once in a while from a full size set. Um, but maybe not. Maybe. I'm okay with this. Usually I work with a smaller 11 by 17 home okay. or whatever you give us and then mm -hmm. use dimensions. I mean, the plans are dimensioned and there's a scale on them. Most of the time. Okay. All right. Well, um, the staff will pursue that. <laughs> I wish I could be pursuing it with you in the future. Yeah. Okay. Are you can provide a tablet. I'm still a citizen. Yeah, just stay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We have a conversation about that. Just staying? I think that's the plan. That's the whole thing. Uh, I have put it, Laura just asked about whether the town would provide a tablet for the board's use during the meetings. Um, the town has provided tablets for the board selectmen's use during meetings, and I have put in a budget request for is forward to have uh, tablets to use during the meetings. We'll see how the budget request fares. I think that's the idea. I think that's the expectation. I think about talking to the tablet companies, they'll get good press. Maybe they'll just give them to us yeah. because of the ACMI. Yeah. 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 We'll just make sure, sure that sure that that's, that Yeah, exactly. So you used a product placement? Exactly, a little product <laughs> placement. That's okay. Yeah. They so do it in the NFL. And we're just like that. Exactly, <laughs> just like it. Send them reviewers the same yeah. number. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to continue. To keep power if you don't mind. Um, the the next item has to do with um, possible zoning bylaw amendments. There's two categories, and uh, I'd like to have the board consider. One is uh, 
a set of uh, zone of bylaw amendment concepts that I'd like you to consider if there is the possibility of a special town meeting. There is also the more long range zoning changes that we would like the board to be considering preparing to bring for annual town meeting consistent with the master plan. Um, so there, I'll do the zoning bylaw amendment concepts for a possible fall town meeting. Um, we should know in the next few days whether there is any likelihood. I do not advocate trying to have a special town meeting just for zoning bylaw amendment changes. This, these would be just to, if a warrant opens for a special town meeting, you, I want, would like you to consider getting these in. One is um, what I'm calling private recreation. And this is basically, all three of these basically look at how certain um, land uses in Arlington have occurred for a long time and says let's legitimize these, let's make the, the map, the zoning map, consistent with uses that have been there for a long time that we expect should continue. So the first one is um, private recreation and it looks at land owned by the Winchester Country Club and the Belmont Country Club as well as the Arlington Catholic playing field and ma makes those uses allowed by right. I'll talk about the two golf courses for a moment. The two golf golf courses have land that extends, Winchester extends into Arlington and Belmont Country Club extends. Yes, on, uh, that's right. So, So it's. Do you want to make copies? No, these, I can share. It's just a nice map, but it's key. These properties are in Chapter 61B, which is a state tax program that allows property owners whose land use is in forestry or agriculture or private recreation. In, in other words, that depends on being kept undeveloped. It gives them the opportunity to apply for a reduced tax assessment. And both of the golf courses have been in that, um, have had that tax designation for some time there. Uh, the Chapter 61B requires that if they wanted to ever sell in the future, they would have to pay the difference between their market rate assessment and what they were assessed at under this reduced assessment program for the previous five years, and they would have to give the community a uh, right of first offer. Right. Well, is it refusal? right of first refusal. It is refusal. Okay. <coughs> and so this says, if, excuse me, the concept behind this is there may be some real benefit to having land held open. And this gives the opportunity, the town, during the time that the state program would have you evaluating your, your back taxes that you're entitled to and evaluating whether you want to acquire it, it would give you the opportunity to evaluate whether to keep the zoning or change the zoning. But it basically says there are there are private recreation areas and we, we acknowledge that and want to provide for that and allow for that and possibly even intend for that in the future. The uh, next one is uh, Cemetery Conservation District. There are the purpose of this is it, to acknowledge that there are natural resources and historic resources that abut the cemeteries in Arlington. This makes the cemetery use by right where there already are cemeteries. <coughs> it makes sense. The special permit requirement that's in the current bylaw post dated the existence of the cemeteries, so they never had, had special permits. There, it would cover the uh, historic Prince Paul Cemetery, the historic uh, Old Burying Ground, <coughs> Mount Pleasant Cemetery, and the privately owned St. Paul's Cemetery. And right now, if you look at the zoning map, um, they're in R1. And I think it's pretty obvious that there's never going to be single-family homes in the cemeteries. So this says, let's 
zone them for what we really, in, I, I don't think there, there's anyone who would say, well, we don't, we don't expect or want <coughs> to continue to be cemeteries. And if they did at such, at such time, if there comes a day where our technology and our culture and our needs would say, let's, let's not have these as cemeteries anymore, there again, the town could consider an appropriate zoning for that, for that time. So, but it also says that if we did contemplate a rezoning in the future, we would first try to do something to protect those natural resources and historic resources. The last one, and, and so this would take, this would say that residential, commercial, and industrial development would not be allowed in the cemeteries. Kind of obvious. It wouldn't give it its own zoning designation. It, it, would, would, it would. It would make it. It would give it the cemetery okay. conservation district. Gotcha. Okay. The last one is the institutional nonprofit district. And this would be for properties that are churches, or museums, or treatment centers, or cultural institutions. And this one essentially covers would. Uh, allow these by right where they are, provided they're not for private gain. That's a phrase that's already used in the bylaw. <coughs> these would be non-profit institutions. Uh, it would include properties owned by all of the churches, by almost all of the property owned by churches, not every single one, and I'll explain in a moment. Um, also, the property owned by um, and occupied by Jermaine Lawrence School and Schools for Children. And schools for Children? Schools for Children and uh, two town owned buildings. So it basically says those organizations will be, those nonprofit organizations will be allowed by right in those <coughs> districts. And it would remove them from residential, commercial, or industrial. A uh, couple examples of why this makes sense. Uh, it's, I could take that map down uh, if it's not too hard. This one? The zoning map that's on the, on the right. I got you. If that's not too big a deal. I'll take this one. That down. A little tag. Oh, yeah, you got yeah. And we can just put it back afterwards. But um, here is an example where on the <coughs> Mass Ave, <coughs> This is an R1 zoning district, with, which is and has been for decades a church. It's between, it's on Mass Ave. It's between two B2 districts with existing businesses. If that were not church, it doesn't seem to me that we would really want single family homes in our business district. It just doesn't make sense. But it could be the mixed use that you may end up with. Or you could. It could be. Yeah. But. Not with an R1. Not with an R1. It wouldn't but, happen with an R1. No, understood. But it could yeah. be instead of going to. So there are a number yeah. of these parcels that are currently zoned R1. Some of them are have other zoning. Um, So I wanted the board to <coughs> consider uh, if a special town meeting, this isn't anything you have to decide tonight, but if a special town meeting is held for other reasons, um, I project based on uh, that it would probably open sometime next month. Um, so if it did open, you would want to decide to if this is something you would want to pursue. If you did want to pursue this, the next step would be to communicate with property owners about what, it, what it, about the purpose of these zoning districts. It it should be clear. I want, I want to make it clear that these would not change their current use. If anything, it just 
reinforces their kind of use. So the the other zoning, I mean I can answer any questions what, right now. What, what would they be rezoned to? Well, in each instance, it's creating a new district. So you'd have, for example, let's say the Cemetery Conservation District. Um, you'd have this new, if this is a sample of the proposed uh, table of uses change, just like you have all of the yeah. residential and commercial industrial across the top, you'd have a new one um, of this private open space. Uh, and it says yes for these uses that would be allowed. So you'd add a new use. You'd add a new. Um, you'd add a new, a new district, district use header in that. the table of uses. Mm -hmm. And for example, private open space, the allowed <coughs> uses would be. Um, there's already a farm use in our bylaw, and that would be would be allowed by right. There is already park, playground, or outdoor recreation facility not conducted as a private gainful business. That would say yes. That means allowed by right. Um, there is already a used country fishing, tennis, swimming, skating, golf club, or so, other so, yeah, I get recreation. That. So and so, so on. But so in terms the, of the nonprofit district. So nonprofit district. The and, and this is so just you, a concept. I'm. Uh, you don't have to take these suggested uses, uh, but just to, for discussion purposes, the uses I've put for the institution of profit would be But it gets a new designation. It gets a new district, district header in the table of uses. It would if you pursued it. And you would designate what would be allowed with a yes meaning by right, and what would be allowed by a special mm -hmm. permit. There are a lot of little. <coughs> there are a lot of little. Well, there are a lot of little parcels of the same the district blue. ones. Yeah. And so, but as so these you, blue guys are all in a uh, what you say institutional non Similarly to B one district. You see B our B one yeah, yeah. district is it's scattered, same, which is isn't all unusual. All That's. So that's the concept there, and I, I can answer questions or. I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with the the private recreation district. Um, are the golf clubs not conducted as a private gainful business? I mean, it's not a public course, I understand that. Do they make money? <coughs> I mean, are they, they are, they have to have nonprofit status to have Chapter 61. Okay. So I intended to check up on the um, Secretary of the, I think it's the Secretary of the Commonwealth. You've got to look up, you can look up the mm -hmm. corporation status of an entity. Oh, okay. Did not yeah, do yeah, that. No, that, that probably yeah. makes sense. And then, just getting a little bit more into the details on the table of use regulations, on the accessory uses, we'd be departing from how we view accessory uses in every other district by saying yes. True, yeah. So, I'm, so that should be special. I'm permit. wondering if that might be better off as a <coughs> sort of open the gate for accessory uses. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, on the the cemetery one. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah. I, I can't imagine there would ever come a time where we would decide that an existing cemetery would be used for anything other than a cemetery. Or that the current owner would think of any other use. Yeah. Than what it's yeah. <laughs> what probably goes into not being a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. I think on, that is a little bit of a no brainer. On the um, institutional non profit district Churches can go anywhere. They, they can, yes. So, so they, they don't really have... need a district. Unless you want to keep all other uses out. And a lot of churches and denominations that go through physical struggle wind up having to sell their building for other uses. And that may be the only way that they... I mean, they're, they're 
putting themselves out of business, but that may be the only when you're the a only answer for organization, that. you do have to dispose of all of your assets anyway to um, correct. That's what's and yeah, I got the AG's happening. approval as to where it's going because it has to fulfill the right. purposes so consistent like, this with. Is, this is unlike I, I I understand what you're saying, but this is unlike the nest egg with a private property owner because it's not supposed to. It's not supposed to be a nest egg. It's supposed to be dis mm. dispersed. But in some cases, some churches may actually be in debt, and they and need so to have the uh, alternative, you know, repurposing of that property for housing or some other mm. use. Mm -hmm. So I just I don't want to want to be careful that we're not you know closing off you know a way for the institution to <coughs> have, yeah. have a have a. a graceful exit mm -hmm. uh, instead of, of continuing. I was discussing of, this with Mike Byrne um, yeah. today because I wanted to have a conversation with him before um, the meeting. And he brought up St. Jerome's. That um, which is the one I thought of. And the board, any, any, in any instance, the town so. can rezone. Oh, yeah. And in fact, I would say you, you would like an opportunity to have a chance to rezone to something that is a use that's consistent with the master plan, that's in, in the right place, in the right part of town. Mm -hmm. So I would say he, he, we play devil's advocate a lot when I'm talking with um, Mike. We both try to really kick the tires on these things before they come here to prime time. Um, prime time is town meeting, but you're, yeah. you're off Broadway. Um, so. <laughs> Fringe. Bruce is off off. So the um, let's say St. Jerome's had been in nonprofit zoning designation and they they knew they intended to sell. They would say, look, we, we need to sell this property. And at that point, the town might even say, we, we really don't, you know, this this is a good time for us to reconsider what, what should go there. And this is an opportune time to rezone that. And you can then do something that's consistent with the master plan, perhaps better than what mm -hmm. the outdated underlying zoning would allow the owner to do. It could be a better mm -hmm. proposition for them and the town. <coughs> I'm, I, my belief is that having that moment is helpful for potentially the market value <coughs> of the property at that point when they're thinking of disposing of the property, but also it's something that town really would want to have yeah, the opportunity but, to do that. But I think getting there is the tough part on this one. I mean, I, I, I think... Getting to that initial underlying zone, changing yeah, the Yeah, changing it, the, changing it the first time. I mean, that's, that's all well and good if they were currently institutional nonprofit. Uh, district, but uh, I mean, I think I think this is a this is a battle royale to try to get these folks to or or to get town meeting. town meeting to understand that this is something that in the end will be a good thing for the for the town uh, as a whole, given who these folks are and probably the fact that. I mean, frankly, I don't know that they're going to be too excited about the concept. So, uh, I, you know, I don't think, I think what you said before, if I, if I can, um, but I think what you said before is, is do you <coughs> folks feel strongly enough about this that we should go out and see what these different uh, constituencies feel about it? I think actually it's a, a little bit backwards. I think we should see what the constituencies think <laughs> before we really... Um, put a lot of time and effort in this because I, I, I think the cemeteries make sense. I, I can't imagine where that would be an issue um, with the current <coughs> cemeteries. Um, with respect to the other two, I guess I'd like to understand what the current um, users uh, feel about this because in the end it will limit the possibilities for them on a go-forward basis. Until and unless the zoning is changed again in the future. Yeah. yeah. So, just as that while we're in the sort of the brainstorming mode on yeah. this, 
Um, have you given any thought to a <coughs> municipal and school use district? No. Uh, some communities have. Um, I haven't. Uh, one of the reasons is we currently don't have in our bylaw, and I think we should have, what a lot of communities have is if, if there's a municipal use, it can go anywhere in town. Mm -hmm. I think in a town like Arlington, you really should have that, and that's that's a simpler proposition than taking existing property and saying these are the limited places where these uses are going to go. Well, though it wouldn't have to be. I mean, you could make a go by <coughs> right in that district, <coughs> but you could still have them go in other places. So are you suggesting that because it would be consistent with the idea of zoning for the current use? Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, it's inconceivable to me that town hall is ever going to be anything other than town hall. I mean, if, if that happens at some point, then you rezone it for whatever you think is the appropriate use, but I can't see that happening in the foreseeable future, nor the library, nor mm -hmm. Arlington High School. I mean, it is consistent with this um, intent of this bylaw concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think the high school right now is R1. And no one's going to build a single family house on the right. plane. Yeah, it is an anachronism. It's, I think there was a time when that the uh, lowest density zoning district was considered the safest default position. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons now why you, you wouldn't want something zoned R1 or or residential, business, or industrial. But I do see your point about um, changing the zoning of town property. Uh, I'd have to think about it a little more and look at uh, the map of the existing town property. And but on its face, at first blush, it doesn't seem... <coughs> it seems consistent, and I think that it would demonstrate to a lot of the property owners who are affected that, you're that doing the same thing. this is, mm -hmm. we're trying to be consistent across the board. I agree with that. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, Anything else? And whether that's a... There's things you could do with a property like the DAV, unless you went back to town meeting again. That, uh, no, sorry, the um, the old disabled uh, vet, the the <coughs> one down by um, like in the Heights, because it's town owned now. Oh, that is town owned now. Yeah. And they're talking about a lot of different things, which mm -hmm. means that it would go to town meeting. But then, just to circle back to the previous discussion, if ultimately we decide there's a a, a, a very good purpose for that site, yeah. then you under in keeping with the master plan, you zone it to what you Through want town to meeting. there. Right. As Through town meeting. To no, I'm saying, so we are eating, or we are, uh, you know, drinking our own champagne or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. a nice way of saying So, give it some thought. You don't have to consider acting tonight or acting at all, but if you do think that this is a direction that, um, it has it has a variety of merits and, and, and helps us in a lot of different ways. And if you do think um, it's worth trying to do this for a special town meeting, if one is called, then uh, I think you want to um, have it on an October agenda. I think it's worth, re as Mike said, reaching out to the constituencies. To the property owners? To the property owners yeah. to see, okay. you know, what they're, what they're uh, Reactions. I think that would be helpful information. Maybe, maybe I'm misreading it. Okay. So I'm going to, um, Laura's going to present with me on this next one. These are some. Um,
Thank you. So in this um, memo, Laura first reviews some of the steps, implementation steps that we've tried to get a jump on already. Excuse me. Could, could, could I ask one question about the previous discussion? That's Mr. Yes. Chairman. Yes. Um, does this have any effect upon the computation under the 40B, 1.5%? I suppose it would if the uses um, do not include residential, commercial, or industrial. Yes. If the new uses, if you changed the zoning of a parcel of land and it wasn't allowed, and residential, commercial, or industrial were not allowed, it would not be considered buildable. So it would help us get... It would help us with respect to one and a half percent. It could. It could. Okay. And I think that's some a target we have to always keep our eye on anytime we change the map. I understand. Mm -hmm. We're definitely aware of the implications of it all. So. The first few items are implementation steps from the master plan that we've tried to get some momentum on already. But then there are some um, some of the implementation steps that, uh, there are a lot of implementation steps about zoning. Uh, the ones that staff recommends the board consider uh, preparing to present to town meeting. In the spring, not the fall. Okay. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. these are ready yeah. for the fall. Yeah. Uh, related to mixed use parking, residential development and neighborhood protection, and um, other zoning changes that are for near term, the, the more immediate priority <coughs> zoning changes. So with, with mixed use, there are some simple things. We already have mixed use in the bylaw. The bylaw says it even encourages mixed use, but when you start to do mixed use, you find some impediments that weren't, um, I don't think were uh, intentional. So this would be a way, I, I think it's important to start looking at what are, the, what are those impediments and how do you overcome those impediments. Um, a better definition of mixed use, um, including a, um, a, a, a really good commercial um, component so that um, it's not just a token amount of the space. Whether that's determined um, in advance on where it should be in the building or not, I, I think it's um, in the master plan it says that that's very important. That was very important to the community for the master plan process. Um, also, allowing uh, reconsidering some height limits and also some incentives to try to realize some of the connections between the bike path, Mass Ave, and water bodies, uh, Millbrook, uh, to consider incentives. And adjusting parking requirements because I don't think the bylaw currently considers shared parking uh, or uh, daytime shifts in parking demand between the two uses. We also think that it's time to look at uh, parking, our minimum parking requirements. Uh, we are <coughs> expecting, we're talking with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council about a parking study of existing parking utilization, uh, residential, uh, not neighborhoods, but multifamily, existing multifamily buildings. And how are they using their parking at night? Uh, is is there excess capacity? So we can start to look at what is the right, what is the right parking ratio. <coughs> now for residential development, um, there is concern about the size of teardowns and um, reducing this, um, trying to look at setbacks, side yard setbacks. 
um, also trying to look at a way, there are lots of um, two-family, traditional two-family houses that are being replaced by a pretty steep center, front and center um, driveway and, and that eats up the front yard basically and creates, in succession, creates a, a lot of very large curb cuts where there used to be a kind of a walkable sidewalk and that uh, we've heard a lot of concern about that. And there are ways we think that that could be addressed and possibly brought to town meeting and still allow for um, the uh, rehabilitation or um, renovation or completely uh, renewing a two-family building. So, do you want to quickly run down the um, the, the other near-term ones? I, I think they're they're they kind of speak for themselves here. But <coughs> the point of this memo is to just kind of get the board's sense of whether you think this is a direction you, you want a little, little more work on this. Do you, are there any things, um, any zoning bylaw amendments in the implementation table that you think we're leaving <coughs> out? Um, do you think this is the right scope of zoning bylaw amendments to bring to town meeting following master plan? So, I mean, when I look at Certainly, a mixed use. You know, <coughs> learn from history of doing to repeat it. So, I think the last time we tried this, I'm not sure we went in with a, a, a full enough notion of mixed use, mm -hmm. and we tried to, you know, do something very small. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a little bit, I guess, I'd be a little bit concerned if we weren't going to figure out how mixed use is going to ripple throughout the zoning bylaws and to make sure that we put the, you know, can we do that before the spring to understand, you know, and to give full thought to, you know, each section of the bylaw and how it might be impacted or affected, I should say, um, by mixed use. Uh, I think, like I said, uh, was it two, three years ago at this point? Two, three years ago when we tried to uh, do the kind of quickie fix on mixed use to see if we couldn't get a little bit more um, uh, what's the word I want? flexibility mm -hmm. in, you know, parking and, and the like. And I think because it didn't necessarily, you know, take a look a little bit more holistically at the zoning bylaw and how this is all going to change, um, I, think, I think that was a problem. And I guess I'd want to make sure that as we're kind of thinking through these, that there'll be more, that there'll be longer term mm -hmm. notions than they will, you know, than maybe what we're trying to do there. Does I that make sense? We've, yes, it does. And I, to that end, I think the um, design guidelines that we worked on right, um, right after the master plan was adopted, I think, um, should be helpful. They should be helpful. They're not the complete solution. Right. To that, uh, but that's the direction that, that's the kind of thing, trying to provide a little more detail about how would it be implemented? What would the consequences be? What would it yield? This, the building of what Mike said, it would probably be good for us to go back and actually look yeah. at that presentation at town meeting and the objections that we faced then, because I think we probably will need to have answers to all those questions. or avoid those questions from coming up by having a better design guidelines and, and a better just way of explaining this to, uh, at the town meeting. Well, right, and I think to that end, it's got to be, this is the first step that we're not planning on changing in two years' time. I mean, this is our mixed-use, mm -hmm. I'm assuming this will be our mixed-use zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. It won't be the mixed-use zoning bylaw until we redo the bylaw. Right? It's not an interim step. This will be the step, right? Yeah. right. And I think that's that's what we use to that end, right? And I think that was. Oh more yeah, of, yeah. I mean, it would be good to have it as complete as possible, but also you know learn from. Oh yeah. Our previous experience with the objections that we got from the floor, you know, what just refresh ourselves as to what they were and yes, how do we how do we answer this? Yeah. And the recodification question is. Important and your input on that is very useful. We're not feeling like 
we want to do that because it's a, a whole year mm -hmm. and you come out with something that reads better but you haven't been in progress. And it's just process. You know, the bed to yeah. do something. No, it, you, change, know, you know. But also not to miss development opportunities. If right. someone wants to develop under the current bylaw, we will have that result on the ground, even though it may be under outmoded zoning that the community doesn't want anymore, we'd live with it for another 50 years, minimum. So that's another reason why we're anxious to have sub more substance um, reflect the master plan. <coughs> the zoning. So my only concern with not doing recodification is that by not simplifying, I think it is difficult to talk about zoning. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's, that's, that's my concern on, on, I mean, we've got a very complex bylaw right now, zoning bylaw. And, you know, we just saw it tonight. Mm -hmm. where, where it, it, right. You know, it, 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 it's, it's hard to reconcile. It's hard to wreck conflicting. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you know, exactly. Yeah. So, so my only concern is, as we start to do kind of wholesale and bigger <coughs> changes to the bylaw itself, without that initial kind of, okay, let's make sure it all works together, yeah. that changing it then, you know, you, you basically got this house of cards and you're going to start like pulling here, pulling there, and without giving it a better base, giving it all these other things. So, I, I don't know, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit concerned, I guess, um, as we kind of go through that, so. And, and you're, you recognize we're not saying we would never do Recodify, but no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I absolutely sure. recognize that uh, that okay. that 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 might you know that might still be on the table. My my concern is unless <coughs> if that's still out there or if you know these other things are. I, I guess I'm a recodification would take two plus years, I, and, and I believe it. <laughs> but I, I think you know where Mike's going on this. If I can say, yeah, step no, into your perspective. You always say it better that, than I do, <laughs> but. But you know, when we when we have a hearing and someone has applied for a special permit for a mixed use project and they're raising parts of the unamended bylaw to say, Oh, but under section whatever, I'm actually allowed to do this. And it really wasn't part of our analysis when we put in the new mixed use provisions. It was just an oversight because we haven't recodified the thing. Mm -hmm. Then I think that would depend on having to on the mixed use amendments mm -hmm. components being having to be crystal clear on what rules. Well, and I think that, you know, I mean, you can draft it in a way to say, notwithstanding any other provision of the bylaw, mm -hmm. you know, this is what happens in a mixed, mixed use. use. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Gentlemen, excuse me, can I make a point? I think I'm the only one in the room who participated in the recodification of 1975, which became effective in 1975. Some of you guys probably weren't even born then. Uh, um, it was a long process. That the case. And yeah. what, what, but what took the pressure off is we had the moratorium. Yeah. I think we were the first time community in the state to have that. Went up to the Supreme Court and we won. But that, that took the pressure off, so we were able to do it. And it's still, with all that, and a lot of people participated, a lot of meetings, and we still didn't get it all right, as, as you know, and we're, we're dealing with this huge and somewhat cumbersome, sometimes contradictory, sometimes what the hell does this mean package. Um, but uh, the, the, the issues that are being brought forth, uh, uh, many of which are listed on this page, are things that are going to come up. I mean, development ain't going to wait for another two years. I don't think we're going to get another moratorium. Uh, at least nobody's even talked about it. Uh, this stuff is going to come up next week, next month, next year for sure. And, and, and we, can't, we, we can't take the risk of, uh, you know, the, the, the good is, 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 the, is the enemy of the best. We, we, we can't wait for the best. In this case, we've we got to do some stuff now. And, and, and the mixed use thing is, is one of them. I, the trouble is with your, old, your previous mixed use thing, it looked like a Trojan horse for bigger and better residential development. Which is not what was wanted in the center. That that was that's the way Loretti phrased it, and that's what carried the meeting. The, I think the big issue, and I guess you are going to get to it, but let me just say it's why I came, is the residential thing, and you've got that mentioned down here. The the the, the devastation being wrought in every neighborhood 
uh, by the developers who are coming in, putting in these mega houses with the, uh, the double garage and the paved front yard. Uh, and I can tell you one thing that you could eliminate with, with a one sentence of Warren article uh, is the scam that says you, you take this little house with its attached garage, you tear it down, but you leave parts of two walls standing, and you build a mega house on the, on the alleged footprint and say, that doesn't require a permit or anything because we're just changing the same. You just take out the words on the same footprint out of, out of the bylaw that, 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 that deals with our traditions. One sentence. That, that would be a quickie. And you could go anywhere in town and talk to people who've run into one of those things. So I think the key is, is just that we just need to be, make sure that as we kind of, you know, <laughs> do start pulling the cards, mm -hmm. that we need to, we need to make sure we really figure out what all the work is on. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be lots of mm -hmm. so. so generally speaking, do you think this is a direction staff could, should go in trying to prepare? I mean, I think it's it's one, two, and three is what we're talking about. Four are sort of other things that we're not mm -hmm. following high priorities right now. For, not not for spring town meeting. Right, unless, unless you tell us otherwise. No, I, I think one, two, and three certainly is biting off a lot. So yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> I think one, it, it's not explicit here, but I think I'll make sure the staff knows that I, I think the mill district relates to item one, mm -hmm. mixed use. Yes. Yeah, let's follow Bruce's suggestion and find out what, remember what we did. And then try to see if we can, if we can make ourselves comfortable enough with the good yeah. and not the yeah. best. And, and I think actually Mr. Warden's point on that, that was one of the, the objections that we exactly. ran into yeah. was, was that it? if, it had one small commercial use component. If you could oh, I set aside it. all oh, the rules yeah, and yeah, put yeah. in a, uh, a huge now residential remember. development. Now I remember that. Yeah, and that okay. So, so, that's, but, so I, but I think we're I think I we're getting at this um, here yeah. because now we're saying there has to be a really viable minimum commercial metric to it. It can't just be, yeah. you know, it can't be an ATM. An ATM yeah. it would yeah. be like the perfect example, right? I, and I think I think what's going to be important in all of this is the is is this is is the involvement that's the right word of the um, uh, master plan implementation right. committee right. Yeah. in it. That's going to be key. Is is to really get them to kind of hunker down on if these are going to be the three areas that we're going to try to make progress for for the spring. Get them on them as soon as possible and get going, because because in the end that will certainly help carry the day on each and every one of these. This will be the first order of business. Yeah. Standards, the design standards of the port or something. Yes, we do have final report. Do we have a final report? Yeah. 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 Needs a little more ceremonial yeah. conclusion, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, I apologize. It's important to the board and to inspection. Plantation <coughs> committee. Yeah. Because there will be another That's right. arrow in the quiver. Yeah. Okay. So that's the zoning. Anything else? So I can jump to work tracking now if you wish. Please do. Okay. Um, you just this evening took care of um, the CPA committee, the ARB seat on the CPA committee, and the uh, Mass Plan Implementation Committee. Um, I believe that the Board of Selectmen will act on the town manager's recommendation. Oh, I have 
typo there. That should be a capital T. Um, we'll act on the town manager's recommendation for the vacant seat on the board, uh, one of the two vacant seats on the board, on October 5th. So, and I have Does reason to believe public? that. Pardon? Has that been made public yet? Or? No. Good. Thank you. And I, I, I'm hopeful that things are warming up a little bit with getting some action on the other vacancy. Okay, I understand. And um, the board still needs to name its liaison to the Open Space Committee. Um, there was a candidate, but then um, her circumstances changed, so she withdrew. So we're trying to work on getting another mm -hmm. Open Space Committee liaison for the board's consideration. Um, there's a lot going on with the buildings right now. Um, the Housing Corporation of Arlington is uh, at, we are at the end of the extensions allowed in their current lease. They are interested in a one-year term. Their term, their current term ends June 30th, and they're, they would like a one-year term. I think that in our from our perspective, the town's perspective, the redevelopment board's perspective, that might be very wise because there is a feasibility study that will is just about to begin on uh, updating the senior center, the um, council on aging space, and the senior center space in the building, um, and there may be some consideration as to whether there is sufficient space and that whether there might be um, more space desirable for other for that use or for other town uses so I want the board to give some thought to whether a one-year lease makes sense and if so uh, we would put out an RFP for that um, I would like to see if you want to give it some thought and then have it on your next meeting to determine unless you have sense this evening and, and want to just go ahead with issuing an RFP of one-year RFP. Is that the same <coughs> the mural room? But, um, it is. If yeah. you're headed towards the mural room, yeah, it's the office is on the left. Yeah. Correct. It's 700, uh, 777 square feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. why, why wouldn't we want to do that? Yeah. Why wouldn't we want to go for a one-year? Right. Because most of our leases are uh, longer. I think the Mystic River Watershed is a one-year lease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah we did do that I can't... Right. I mean, it's so we have an offer for one year. The existing tenant would like to um, stay. We have to oh, for put another it up year. For another, another, year. another year. But we have to put, unless they just stay as a tenant at will, we can do that, but properly we should issue an RFP. Mm -hmm. Issuing an RFP and going through the business process takes time and effort. Yeah, so to do it just for one year is a little so bit of a, yeah, yeah, that's a, little a of waste. Of but they are unsure of whether they would uh, be interested in staying for another year, and the town might actually want the possibly. Space. So then, don't don't do anything then, because they can stay at will, mm -hmm. and then both people have flexibility. It doesn't. Does that put us at any uh, disadvantage if we any don't? Um, liability? Yeah, I don't know, but it's a question I could get answered to. Yeah, if you could. I suppose you could still have a tenancy agreement with a tenant as well. Right, and mm -hmm. right at least from a liability and define the liability issue. Right. And, and, and get a certificate of insurance as well. So yeah. Notice a, a longer than one month notice. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to see if I misplaced something. Sure. You were also sitting against that back wall, so take a look over there too. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Oh. So there's also this, uh, we've, uh, I think the town manager's office is preparing to issue a contract to Sterling Architects uh, to do a feasibility study on updating the space. Andrew is on the feasibility study committee, um, which is, uh, thank you for doing that because I wasn't <coughs> here, so good to have some continuity. Mm -hmm. um, the
contractors finally, after these many years, um, going to begin work in early October to restore the porches on 23 Maple Street. And yeah. that did um, get a certificate of appropriateness from the Historic Districts Commission. And I spoke with the chair t this morning, who's very happy that the work is um, going to proceed. Uh, that work, I believe, will should be done in a couple months. Great. We are still waiting to hear from um, the Commonwealth about their decision on who will get the privilege of leasing to the um, Department of Mental Health and the uh, Department of Developmental Services. We submitted a proposal in July. There are seven other proposals wow. competing with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to um, try to see if I can. It's a fool's errand, but I, I feel compelled to try to get them to give me some update anyway. They, they're <laughs> very tight lipped. They don't typically say anything during the time they're considering the proposals. Um, central school paving, you, we have money in the capital uh, plan. You know, we don't have money. We have authorization to use money in the central school account for um, the site's paving and um, the Disabilities Commission uh, considered three of the five concepts acceptable. Uh, we would need to develop those into bid specifications. Um, if the grading is changed for any of these, it would have to go to the Historic Districts Commission. So I think the next step is that needs to um, that needs more work with the landscape architect. So you and I will have to talk follow up on that. Uh, the Academy Street entrance of the building is in touch. Right? The yeah. original brownstone steps, um, I'm afraid <coughs> they need to be replaced. Uh, the foremost historic masonry expert uh, did a report on those steps this year. And I even made him look under the steps to see if they could be flipped and repurposed, because you can do that with bluestone but these weren't cut in, in a way where they could be. So uh, <coughs> they will probably be replaced with wet cast concrete if um, it's just... Yeah, go to the district commission for that, too. Yes, we do. That's right. Yes, sir. And the bluestone and concrete steps that are a little closer to Academy Street need to be repointed, and you know the railing was vandalized, and um, I also understand there's a way to make it more ADA compliant. So that has to be redone in the glass. The <coughs> system has to be redone. So it's a lot of work. Um, and the Jefferson Cutter House, uh, we are awaiting bid specifications from the architect who prepared the um, building assessment over the winter. Uh, we received a matching grant. Um, $65,000 will be reimbursed by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Uh, that has to be done by June 30th, so that's a very tight time frame, but it can be done. I wish I was going to be here to write her on all these things, but I'll have to be a spectator. Uh, and we talked about the electronic meeting materials concept and trying to move in that direction. We talked about zoning bylaw amendments. Um, we have no update at this time on the Millbrook District. and. On the East Arlington project, um, roadway paving is underway, and you have seen that the trees have been planted and benches gone in. Um, if there's anything that you expected to see on the work tracking report but didn't, let me know, and I'll add it for next time. Um, most, a lot of these are just standing items, and as you know, uh, updates are in bold. So if you want to add something at any time, let me know. Any questions? Concerns? Good. Rule of the minutes. I had no comments. None for me. None for me. I move to approve the minutes of the August 17th, 2015, uh, on the development board meeting. Second. <coughs> in favor? Aye. 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 Before we adjourn this evening, I want to say thank you to Carol Kowalski for all her hard work over the years. <clears throat> you will be missed. I had something planned out in my head earlier today, but I've already <laughs> forgotten it. Uh, you have been a great help to me in my brief time on the board. 
Uh, I know that Laura will do an excellent job, but you will still be very sorely missed by all of us. Well, thank you. I will miss all of you. I, this is very, I'm very wrapped up in this. <laughs> I live here, and I'm very passionate about the work, and I, I, I love this work, and I really enjoy it. I've been very lucky to have a great board to work with, and we're going to miss working with you. So, so once in a while, I'll come and sit in the back. That's right. That's right. That's right. I keep my mouth shut I'm, unless it's something like this. CBS horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. So We're thank have you. Another one. <laughs> you can't have too many CBS. I, I really appreciate each and every one of you, and I've enjoyed you so much. And I've, I've just considered myself very, very fortunate to work with talented, dedicated people, and to have the skills that, uh, that I've had on this board available to me. And, and your civility is very, very appreciated. So. Thank you for being great. <laughs> Made it a pleasure. I miss you. Well, Carol, you, you, you've done an incredible job. I mean, I was here right from the... When you yeah, were, you've been on the whole time. When you wow. were a gleam in the eye. Fairly. <laughs> a gleam in the eye. And we interviewed and brought you on among, among a lot of good candidates. And um, you grabbed a hold of it and presided over some really important things for the town. And uh, with a great spirit. and. Uh, Great attitude, work well with all your your board, and um, I mean your your planning department and your board, mm -hmm. and did some really important things for the town with a great, you know, just a fun person to work with while you were doing it. Oh, so that's great. It made it enjoyable for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. yes. and you got to preside over lots of different members that aren't even here right now, and and you know take care of a the obstreperous board at times. No obstreperousness, <laughs> but... <laughs> so we, we, uh, I think we, I can say we all appreciate your efforts, and I think the town should appreciate, uh, in a big way, a lot of the things you've it done. It was a privilege. It was a privilege and um, a real pleasure. And nothing like teamwork. You know, nothing I did, I did on my own. When are we going to be able to toast you, is the question. Well, we'll talk about that. I'm we'll not moving. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but that's good. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've been Thank the lucky ones. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. You're so, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate it very much. All right. With that said, now we can adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. All in favor. <laughs>